Okay, please stand for the reading of the word. We're in Psalms. Hallelujah. Habakkuk can be so hard to find. (laughs) You always know where Psalms is, dead center. So, Psalms 1. Hope that's not yours, Bart. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. In In his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. All right. Am I? Yes, I can hear my voice. Oh no! It's this. This thing collects paper and notes and old things. That these are announcements from weeks ago. You know what was really encouraging for me this morning is is um, not just with prayer. Prayer. Thank you guys for meeting with me and and praying and walking around the church this morning. Um, we were going to give a mighty shout and have all the walls fall down so that we could have kind of an open air this morning, but, but we, we didn't do that. Um, but another thing that just really encouraged me this morning uh, was singing worship and hearing one of our children, in fact, Evie, right here, uh, singing beside me. And uh, man, the, the praise uh, that she, and she was just singing, man. No, not, not holding back. Um, it just inspired me. I got distracted. I pulled out my phone and started doing something. And I heard her singing, and I was just like, oh, man, Lord. Wow. That is, thank you. Thank you for that, Lord Jesus. Um, we are in the Psalms this morning, starting off a whole new series, uh, which I'm excited with. I have a video also. Hopefully that will work. If it doesn't, then I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll do something else. Um, I'm, int- I'm very interested in how this sermon will go. Uh, because I tried to practice uh, what I'm preaching uh, this morning, and uh, I want to share that with you as a way of encouragement and a way of, of teaching, um, and then also we're going to practice that together. Good morning, Frank. Come on in. It's good to see you and Levi today. Um, but let's, let's begin with prayer. Um, let's ask the Lord to come into this place. Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you that, uh, that you're present with us, Lord. And you reminded me of that this morning. This is a holy place because the holy God of gods is gathering with us. As we gather, Lord, and we know that you reside within each one of us who believes in your name, who's given our faith uh, in, in Jesus. You've become a part of us, Lord. But as we gather together, it's like your presence is just overwhelming. God, I pray that it is. And Lord, help us this morning to, to, to be a people who listen for your voice. Let us be this morning a people who are eager to hear your direction and your wisdom, God. For you're our head and we're the body. We want to go to the places where you want us to go. We want to do the things that you want us to do. We want to be the people who you call us to be. God, we want to go with the gospel. Lord, give us opportunities. Let us be the people who say your name among the, the people who don't know you, Lord. We want to be eager for that. Lord, give us opportunities. And then last, Father, we want, to, we want this to be a place of power. We don't want it to be benign. We don't want it to be bland. We don't want it to be boring. God, we want this place to be exciting and powerful because you are in it and you're an exciting and powerful God. We believe that. So, God, we pray that you would demonstrate your power among us and in us, God, this morning. We pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, today we are in the midst of Memorial Day weekend, which is a a time to honor America's history uh, with gratitude. Gratitude. It's a time to remember the bravery and the courage, the sacrifice of our troops. And uh, for all of you who have served in our our military. If you're joining us online or you're here today, we want to say thank you for your service Uh, because it grants us and it protects our freedom to worship. Uh, And we shouldn't take that for granted. We should not take that for granted because freedom from religious persecution is unique. 
It is a blessing that we enjoy. It is not everywhere in our world, nor is it everywhere in history, but it is here and it is now because men and women have fought to protect it and so that we could have it. And so we want to honor them today by, by enjoying that freedom. We want to, uh, we just want to press into that and go, man, thank you, God. Thank you for these men and women. Thank you for this freedom that we have. We can read your word openly with the windows open in here. We can sing songs of praise with the door open. And nobody's coming in here and telling us we can't do that. But that's, like I said, not everywhere. Thank God it's here. Thank God it's now. And so uh, with that, we're just going to jump into the word. But I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't go past, uh, just kind of brush that aside. Not, not today, not this weekend. We are looking at the Psalms. We're going to look at Psalm 1 today. And as a summer series, it's perfect because you can kind of come in and out uh, through this. And, and, and it's okay. You know, we have vacation time during the summer. We have times we're going out and we're camping. We're experiencing. Bob and Isaac and I were outside yesterday climbing. It was so nice. So great to be outside. And, and, and yeah, that's, that's a part of our summer. So a, a sermon series through Psalms is perfect because you can come in on a Sunday, you can miss a Sunday, and then maybe catch up on it online, but then you come back the next week and then these Psalms are self-encapsulated. They're, they stand on their own. It's like you can come in, you don't have to know well, what happened last week in the, in the story right? You can just kind of enter in and, and be blessed by it. So I'm excited about that. Uh, Psalms in the Hebrew is the word tehillim, right? And it means praises. It's in the plural, tehillim, so, or it means songs of praise. And it's a song book uh, for the Jewish people. Um, Psalm 1 and 2 can be read together, although I'm just going to go through one today, but I did want to point out that the beginning of Psalm 1 is, blessed is the man, and then if you get to the end of Psalm 2, it ends in a similar way to say, um, to say, kiss the son, talking about the Lord's anointed, the uh, Meshiachu, that his anointed, lest he be angry and you will perish on the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled, but blessed are all who take refuge in him. So blessed is the man at the beginning, and it tells us about that, and it ends with blessed are all who take refuge in him. It's beautiful, beautiful. So what I want to try and do is I want to try and show you a video. Now this video is going to give an overview of all the Psalms. Okay, it's a little bit lengthy, so I'm going to go down, and I'm going to sit down uh, for this, but I want to make sure that, that we could do, we could see this. It just has so much information about how the Psalms are laid out. So The book of Psalms. Oh, it's working. It's a collection of no, it's not. Ancient Hebrew poems. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay. Ah, I just don't understand that. Maybe it was in. Right, right. So the MP4 just didn't work, huh? We're gonna have to work on that, huh? That's weird. I mean, I can play it on my iPad here for everybody. You could do that. It's kind of small. Um, so, uh, okay, that's fine. We'll just, we'll just move on into, uh, into the Psalms. Uh, just know that Psalms is divided. That video does a really great job. You can look it up on YouTube uh, and watch uh, the Bible Project kind of outline the Psalms. And it breaks it up into five books. And it shows these themes that kind of go through, this lament and praise. And it's just really, really cool to really understand as you read through the Psalms what it's all about and how it's divided up. And I'm gonna f we'll figure out this video stuff uh, later. Um, but anyway, let's, let's jump into our text. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of exposition here. I'm going to look into uh, the Psalm uh, just kind of verse by verse. And then, and then we'll see where where we go from there, all right? Psalm 1, Psalm 1, blessed is the man. And Job, did you say, just go to the middle, right, Bob? And then, then there it is. Yeah, there we go, all right. And I'm gonna open up my, my translation here so that I have it in the Hebrew as well. There we go. Man, and tell you what, I mean, there was, a, a lot of notes uh, on, on this. There's a lot that's in uh, this book. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But, it's a big contrast word. We're going to see there's a lot of contrast in this psalm. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So, um, so here we see there are two paths. That, that the psalmist is pointing out. As he begins the psalms, and, he's, and, and we're about to jump into the songbook, he, sa- he, he points with wisdom, because this is a wisdom psalm. It's a psalm that's written to, to the foolish and to the, to the, to the, to the unwise, uh, maybe the simple, so that they can have wisdom. And he says there's two ways, there's two paths. And I, I remember talking to my daughter Carmen, and her story is... is uh, is, is a story of prodigal, of, of wandering away. And, and she, out of her mouth, she says this. She says, Dad, I, I realize that there's, there, there's a choice for, for all of mankind. And that is, who are you going to give yourself to? And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to my daughter say this, and I'm just like, yes, thank you, Lord. But she says, there's a choice of who you give yourself to. You can give yourself to the kingdom of darkness. Or you can give yourself to the kingdom of light. You can give yourself to the rulers of darkness or you can give yourself to the God of light. And this is, this is the choice that the psalmist is putting out there. He's saying, he's saying choose. He's saying be wise. And he uses the word blessed. Blessed or happy. Now, as, as, I, as I read through this psalm, it was interesting how many times my heart was reminded of the Beatitudes, of the Sermon on the Mount, right? So even, even in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Again, this two paths, two different directions that we can go. Um, but it is not, he's not just pointing out the blessing. At the beginning, he starts in the negative, And he says, blessed is the, uh, is the man who does not. It's not walk in the counsel of the wicked, who does not stand in the way of sinners, who does not sit in the seat of scoffers. He's putting out three different degrees of involvement that, that we would have with, the, with people who are, are, are wicked, our sinners, our scoffers. And there's three different degrees of wickedness there, finally culminating in the scoffer, the person who, who, uh, who not, not just walks in wickedness, but mocks wisdom, who mocks the way of God. It reminds me of those who mock Jesus during the crucifixion, and it makes me kind of go, when I read the account, because it's not smart to provoke a holy God. These are the ones who deconstruct God's ways and divert those who pursue his ways. And, and, and the, the, the progression is this, and we, we've talked about this. We talked about this in Ephesians as we went through Ephesians, right? That, 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 that the progression is that as if somebody is walking along the way and they overhear uh, some type of tempting, evil conversation, and they, they, they begin to, to tune into that. And they begin to walk a little closer. And then they, they, they stop their walking to stand and to hear more. And then suddenly they're, they're swept into it, and they, they begin to sit down. Uh, the word in the Hebrew there it actually can mean to dwell or to live there. And they live among the scoffers. And then in, in Ephesians, we looked at, at how Paul uses kind of those three words, but he uses them in a different order. He's, instead of walk and stand and sit, he says sit, walk, and stand, right? He changes the orders to emphasize our belonging, that we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places, right? That's in chapter 1. He, he challenges our thinking. He says, walk worthy of, our, of your calling. Walk as children of the light. Walk wise not as the unwise or the ungodly. And then our behavior is that we stand, that we stand in the full armor of God and that we stand against the forces of evil in high places on that evil day. I just love how Paul takes that, just almost 
takes that Psalm 1 and just kind of turns it around and, and makes it an encouragement for us. And here's what we need to be encouraged in. We need to be encouraged to delight in the law of the Lord and to meditate on it day and night. This is what the righteous do. They delight. And I'm so glad that, it, that the, the psalmist here doesn't say, blessed is the man who, who knows or understands the law of the Lord. But he uses the word delight. And, and in the Hebrew, it, it's, it's talking about pleasure. And it has this relational quality to this fondness, this affection. This, and you know these people, right? You know these people who, who love God's word. Now, I can count them, the people I've encountered in my life, probably on, on these two hands, who I get around. And there's something about them. There's a quality to their life. I don't have to know them very long. It just almost seeps through their pores. They glow, especially when they encounter God's word and when they read it, or it just comes out of their mouth. And you get this sense when you're around them that they know something about God that I don't know. They know God in a way that I, that's weird and attractive all at the same time. It's like I want to spend time with these people because I want to know what they know. Do you know these people? Do you know what I'm talking about? This is who the psalmist is describing here, someone who delights in the law of the Lord. Now, in the, if we understand the Hebrew, for the, for the ancient Hebrew, this is how he saw the law of the Lord. He didn't see it as, as a, a list of rules. He didn't see it as oppressive. He didn't see it as, as taking away his joy, but actually the thing that, that gave him joy they saw this book as God disclosing himself to them so that they could, they knew now, they knew this is how we walk in relationship with a holy God. This is how we become his people and he becomes our God. This makes us special. And they love this. In fact, they have a, a Hebrew um, festival called Simhat Torah, right? And it's called the joy of the Torah. And you'll see uh, these, these rabbis, and they, and they grab the Torah scrolls because they're huge. I had the, 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 um, the joy of, when I was last in seminary, uh, weekly going and reading from a 500-year-old Torah scroll. And it was, it was giant. It, was, we had, it had a glass room that was as big as this piano here that had this scroll in it because they had to keep it, uh, they wanted to keep it from deteriorating. It was, it was, uh, it was ancient, but it was giant. And we would have to roll it to the next, the next reading of the Pashara every week and, and, uh, and use the Yad because you didn't want it, you couldn't touch it. So they have this pointer called the Yad, which in Hebrew, Yad means finger. And so it's this little pointer thing that you use to read. Uh, but they dance with these giant scrolls, right? They put them in these big cases and they're just lugging them around and dancing because there is joy for them in that. Joy. That's a little bit crazy for us. Well, we could try it. Dance around with our Bibles during worship. I don't know. Let's, uh, let's, let's move on. Let's, uh, I want to keep, continue to kind of get into the exposition here. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. So there's this picture that I found, and it's almost the perfect picture, all right? Doesn't it look peaceful? just want to be there. Um, that it would be, it's almost perfect because there's no, there's no fruit on the tree. Um, and so I wanted to find a fruit tree that's in that location looking like that, uh, but I couldn't find that. So I got this one right here. And, and it, but it does illustrate, and it does give us a picture of what, what it looks like for the righteous person. This is, this is what we are to be. We're to be like a, a tree who's planted by streams of water. Now, this is, this is where I get really excited, okay? Um, because as I read this passage and I, and I get into the, the grammar of the Hebrew, these, these words are, this word planted is passive. 
The word for planted is passive. It means the action is happening to the subject. So it's, I don't plant myself here. This is where God plants me. Isn't that beautiful? And it's, and it's not just by a stream of water. In the Hebrew, the, the word is for an artificial water source. It's a canal. So it brings this into my mind, this idea of a garden, that God has prepared a place for me to dwell. And it's a place of provision, right? It, it talks about this tree, and it talks about, like I said, it doesn't have fruit on it. I wish it did, because it, it says it gives, this tree gives fruit in its season. It gives, and the word in the Hebrew is natan. It's where we get the, the, the name Nathan from. So if your name is Nathan, it means to give in, in Hebrew. But, but, but our, our purpose is to be planted there so that we can give fruit when it's time. And everything that we need is provided for us. He's placed us in this orchard, in this garden, beside a stream of water. He's, prov- he's dug the ditch so that water, life-giving water, can go to that, to that planting. I just love that. I just love that. He says, the metaphor continues, though, in the contrast. The wicked are not so. Contrast that to the righteous. The wicked are not so, but they are like the chaff that the wind drives away. So let's, let's see that, that picture there. So the two hands there show, um, on one hand, this would be the left hand for you guys, um, is, is chaff. Uh, and then what they want is the seeds, which are in the right hand there. And you have to separate the two. Okay? We don't understand this because when we go to the store and we want bread, we go to the store and we get bread, right? No, we don't have Martha Stewart's around here who are taking their wheat out in the backyard and throwing it up in the air. But this is how they did it, right? Um, and they, they would go out and they would have a big pile of this stuff and they would know that half of it is garbage. It's refuge. It's the husks. It's pieces of straw, and they don't want that in their bread. You don't want that in your bread, right? You just want wheat. So they take it, and they scoop it up, and they throw it up into the air on a windy day. What happens is the wheat falls back to the earth, into the pile, and the chaff is blown away by the wind. It's just taken away. And this is the picture of what what will happen, or or what the, the, the... this is what the, the wicked are like. They're like chaff. They're, they're refuse. You don't repurpose chaff. It's, nobody wants it. It's good for nothing except to be driven away by the wind. Now, um, interesting, uh, we just got out of Habakkuk, right? And you remember in Habakkuk chapter 1, the Chaldeans that are coming to, to be, bring correction to God's people, he says they are like the east wind that gathers up captives like sand and blows them away. And just as soon as it comes through, it's gone. And describing the Chaldeans coming through. So wind, this, this word in the Hebrew, ruach, it, it, it is at times a picture of life for the Hebrew because God breathes his life into Adam but at the same time, it's, it, it's, it can be used as a picture of God's judgment to blow away, to drive away uh, the wicked. It's kind of interesting to think about that for, for the righteous, God's breath brings life into us. And for the wicked, that just, the wicked, God's breath is, drives them away. Anyway, so um, let's look at this chart that I have because I, I want to point out the contrast here before I get into this um, talking about. Look at, look at all the contrast that is, that is here within these six verses, right? The, the contrasting the way of the blessed with the way of the wicked. And you can look at the, at the way of the blessed. They delight in the law of the Lord. They're like a tree. that They are planted. They are located by streams of water. They prosper. Uh, there's, they're not with, there's no withering, but they're, they're bearing fruit, and they're known by God. The way of the wicked, they dwell with the scoffers. They're like the chaff. They're blown away. They have no standing in the judgment. They have no standing among God's people. We'll see that in just a moment. They're like husks and straw. They're worthless. And this idea of depart from me, also found in the Beatitudes, or in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, 
their, their way will perish. So let's look at those last two verses. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. All right. So we want to connect this to the previous verse. We have this picture of, of, of the wicked being like chaff that are blown away. Okay? And the, the word for, for judgment is abed. It, it has the root meaning of, of to, to run away, to be driven away. It can also be used as to perish or to be lost or to go astray or to die. And, and the, the psalmist is bringing us, in, in trying to give us wisdom, he's bringing us to the outcome of what these two paths become. And there is wisdom in considering the outcome of behavior. And this is what verses 5 and 6 do. Here the wicked will not stand. They don't have a place among the righteous. They've dis- despised the salvation of God for foolish and momentary satisfaction. And he's saying, consider their outcome. But the contrast here is amazing. It is, it's really cool. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows. He knows. And the word in the Hebrew there, yada, to know, is, is deeper than just knowledge. In fact, it's similar to delight. It's an active knowing. It's a relational knowing. It's an intimate knowing we want to be known by God this way. For him to know us, not only, not only to know of us, but to know our name and to pursue us in relationship. This is true happiness. This is what it means to be blessed. This is what drives us and motivates us to delight in his law because it connects us to God. So, so listen to this, right? Listen to this. The point of this psalm is to get us to a place where we receive the living water. We receive what is provided for us. And he's trying to be very careful to show us that there's a way where we don't do that. Where we're in all the right places, but there's no life. Right? We want to be a people who delight in the law of the Lord. How do you get there? How do you become that? Okay? So what I did this week, um, starting on Friday, I had all my notes, and I'm leaving out some of this right now, which is great. Um, So I did all my study, did all my translation work, right? Made lots of notes here. It's all good stuff, very good stuff. But I, this, this was the knowing for me. This was cerebral, right? And so then, but I want to I wanna live out this verse. I want to put it into practice. I want to delight in the law of the Lord. And on it, I want to meditate day and night. And the word in the Hebrew for meditate is, is to growl, okay? There is a vocalization to this, okay? Now, I'm not sure. Now, here's, here's what I did. I spent all Friday working out on that hillside over there because these, we, we spent uh, as a church a whole day chopping out all of these berry vines, right? And they started to spring up and they've started just to get underneath my skin. I look at them and I hate them, right? <laughs> I look at them and, and there's this, uh, it's like I'm going to war with these guys. Um, now, if you look over here, we cut out all of that all the way to the fence, and you can see it already growing up, and it's green, and it's driving me crazy, okay? I can't deal with that, but I can't deal with this hillside in front of the parsonage because I look out the window and I see it. So I spent the day digging them up, pulling the roots. As you pull on the root, it just sprays soil all over your face, right? But I'm going to war. I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm in this, right? And there was some growling that was happening, Okay, now this vocalization, I began to think about this and, and, and wonder about that. What does it mean 
so that we, that we meditate. Is it the own, you know, you empty yourself and allow just everything, every demonic thing to pour into you? Or, or, or is, it, is meditation for us that, that we go with already something? We're already full and we want to we wanna, we wanna turn it over. We want to roll it around in our mouths. I mean, it may be that, that as you read the, the scripture and you say, blessed is the man who, walk, who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe some of that, you know. Uh-huh. May, you may get an amen, you know. It may just come out of you because you're responding to it. I think it's more than that, right? I think there's a, it's not just growling, but to mutter under your breath is the idea. That we're kind of talking to ourselves. I used to get in trouble for that when I was younger. People would go, are you talking to yourself? And I'd be like, uh, no, but I was, right? I was ashamed that I was doing that. Like, it was a bad thing. But now I'm getting to the place where I'm like, no, that's not such a bad thing. So I'm out there and I'm digging up these berries and I'm pulling them up. I'm going, Lord, what does it mean to, how do I delight in the law of the Lord? How do I meditate on it day and night? And this is good because I can, I can do this. This is my meditation, God. I, I don't have to think. I can think about you as I do this and go to battle and work hard. And I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking, I'm preaching to myself. And I'm thinking, and he's bringing things to mind. It's like, well, it's, it, maybe it's like gargling, right? We gargle, you know, sometimes to, to, to get something into all the places in our mouth, right? Maybe it's like that. We're taking the, the, the picture, right? It's kind of like a metaphor, like he's talking. We're trying to get it all into our mouths. Maybe the word of God does need to fill our mouths. So it's what comes out when we speak, right? Maybe that's it. And then I thought about people who, who drink wine, and they're like really good at it, right? They drink wine, and they're not just chugging it, right? They're like savoring it. It's like they're, they're sipping it, and, it's, and, they're just, and they're like lost in this wonder of, of what they're tasting, right? And they're describing things that I'm like, it just, it's just wine, right? And they're like, no, it has these, has these dark tones to it. it has, it's nutty. It has this fruit. Fruity. Can you taste, the, can you taste the, the, the chocolate hints in there? And I'm like, no, I, it's just, I, I'm sorry. I just chugged mine. Uh, was I supposed to taste that, you know? And these are, these are people that we like. When we go to a fancy restaurant, we're spending lots of money. We want them to come to our table and go, tell us what, what wine goes well with this, you know? I, 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 want my, I want my meal to like be this experience that's so full and it's like beyond what I can... I, I want to remember this, right? These are special people. I tried it actually uh, uh, Friday night. As some friends, uh, they don't go to seed, but maybe they will someday. Um, and and uh, he said, well, what would you like to drink tonight? I was like, oh, I've been thinking about this all day. Do you have any wine? I want to just, I want to experience this, you know, as I'm thinking about the word of God. And, 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 and so I want to just feel like that. And, he, and he's like, well, would you like anything else? Because do you have any espresso? He's like, I do. It's perfect. It's a little tiny cup. And I'm just like, hmm, and just experiencing it, right? I'm letting it roll around in my mouth. Okay. Don't get too far into my talking of wine and espresso. We're talking about the word of God here, right? That we want to, we want to, to taste and see that the Lord is good. I, I like this, uh, this, um, this, oh, where is it? Lord, where'd you put my name? Yes, ha, ha, ha. Kristen gave me this quote from Charles Spurgeon. You know how much I love Spurgeon. He says, not by the hasty reading of the word, but by deep meditation, we profit by the word of God. Not by hasty reading, but by deep meditation, we profit by the word of God. Think about that. I think he was thinking about Psalm 1. What does it mean to profit? In all his ways, he succeeds. In all the ways, he, he prospers. Is this some kind of wealth, health and wealth, uh, prosperity kind of teaching here? Actually, in the Hebrew, that, that means that, that, that he, he accomplishes what was intended. And what was intended, he was planted. Why? So that he could give fruit. He is going to bear fruit in its season. He's not going to wither. And everything, the reason for being where he is, is going to be accomplished. It is not about getting money or wealth. 
It's about getting God. Isn't that beautiful? Now, so I'm thinking about this, and I'm thinking about, and I'm pulling these, these you know, this, Lord, what are you teaching me here? Why am I doing this, God? This is pointless. I mean, in a week, these things will be back, right? And he says, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of scoffers, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And I went, oh, this is not an easy thing to do. This isn't easy for me not to do this, not to listen to the counsel of the wicked. It's not easy for me not to stand in the path of sinners. It's not easy for me not to sit in the seat of scoffers. I think I, I, I've read this in the past and just thought, well, you just don't go there, right? You just avoid that guy. You just isolate yourself. This is easy. I just don't do this. I don't read those books. I don't watch those TV shows. But it's much more invasive than you or an I could ever imagine. And as I'm pulling these blackberries, I'm going, it's like these. They keep coming back. And I want to pull them up by the roots and I want to get them out. See, it's not hard for me to be selfish. That's not a struggle. It is not hard for me to believe a lie. It is not hard for me to be lazy. I do that naturally. It is not hard for me to be rebellious. It is not hard for me to love sugar. I just do. It doesn't matter what kind of sugar it is. There's something natural in me that just it has a tendency towards that. And God was pointing that out. He was saying, look. He says, you've got to go to war with this, Bart. Just like you're going to war with these berries. When you see them spring up, you've got to be quick. Grab them by the throat and rip them out. Because that's what your enemy is doing. That's what he wants to do. You're a tree planted by streams of water. How is he going to get to you? I'll try and rip you right out of there. And he's not as environmentally conscious as you are, Bart. He's okay using crossbow and poisons. And he's going to inject that right at the root. And if you're not drinking from this water, if you're not delighting in this law of the Lord, actively, what does it say? These are adjectives that define the frequency Daily and nightly, if you're not doing that, that poison is going to sink in. And your only hope is to, is to drink deeply from this stream of life to dilute the poison. I used to drink uh, Coca-Cola. Um, it was my thing in college. I, w- I would have like two liters, like lots of them at home. And when we would get low, it'd be like, oh, panic, you know, we need more of that. Um, and I would go, maybe go through a two liter a day sometimes. It was not good for me. I was fat. Um, I was, uh, it was taking the enamel off of my teeth, right? Not healthy for me in so many other ways, right? My liver, you, I've already told you I had a fatty liver, right? And it was all from drinking the soda, just nonstop, nonstop. And one, one uh, New Year's, my, my daughter said to me, she said, Dad, she said, last year I, I decided I wasn't going to drink soda, You want to do that with me this year? And I was like, no, I really don't want to do that with you. I really don't. And she was like, please, Dad, come on. I said, all right, I'll try. And I tried unsuccessfully for a week and then, you know, then kind of felt guilty. So then I really started to do it. And now I don't drink soda. I have a taste for water, right? And now it's funny now that I go back and I, you know, somebody offers me a Coke and I go, okay, yeah, and I drink it. I'm just like, whoa, what is this? This is, this stuff, it tastes like chemicals. It's burning. It burns my mouth. It burns my nose. I used to be addicted to this stuff. And I think when we went through Hebrews in the fire, the fire guys, us fire guys, <laughs> we're talking about in the book of Hebrews, and it talks about um, 
being able to, to, to discern from good and evil, and that the people who are able to do that do that because they train themselves through training so that they can discern between good and evil. And I th I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, it, it is a wonderful thing that, that we are able to train ourselves, even our tastes, away from things that are bad for us towards things that are good for us. It takes time and it's hard. It is hard work. Addiction is hard to overcome. And I'm addicted to evil. I'm addicted to the way of the scoffer. So easy for me to fall into that. And I think the, the, what, the, what the, the psalmist is trying to do here is he's, he's begging us. He's saying, please, please realize the value of the law of the Lord in your life. How it's a protection for you. How it will train you to discern between good and evil. You'll be able to taste it and go, wow, that's not what I want. That's not true. That's garbage. I don't want that anymore. I don't want life and I'm seeking life and I'm finding it in a God who knows me. Like I said at the beginning in that chart, that here's a fascinating thought, that God knows us. How vital is it for us to be known by God? Matthew 27, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. How do we do the will unless we first know the will? and love the will, and be dedicated to the will, and to battle against everything that is not the will of God. But many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And I believe that the psalmist gets in verse 5 to that point of saying, those words, I never knew you, are words that will haunt you for an eternity. And they should terrify us in the here and now because uh, with, those, with those words uh, will be judgment. And someday, that will be the only thing that has any value, to be known by God, the only thing that matters. So I have to ask the question, are you known by God? The Bible says there's a book and in it are the names of God's children and they're recorded. Is your name in that book? These are the people who know God personally. These are people who are in relationship with him and are part of his family and he is their forgiving father. Already, already, there is a way for all of us to know forgiveness and life today. Already there is a way that we can change our path from a path of wickedness into a path that brings life. And I would love to tell every one of you who don't know that, if you're on Zoom this morning, I'd love to tell you. You can email me. I'll tell you about Jesus. I'll tell you about the cross. I'll tell you about the resurrection and how by faith in him gives you new life. You know what's crazy? What's even crazier? This is where it like gets into the next level. John 1.14 says that the word became flesh and dwelled among us. Right? To delight in the law of the Lord and to meditate on it day and night. And then there's a part in here that says that God's revelation of himself and the way that we can walk in relationship with him actually became flesh and blood and became a real life person who came to further show us forgiveness, who came to further show us how to walk with God, who came to show us what life really means. The word became flesh and it dwelt among us, kissed the son, his Messiah, Blessed is everyone who finds refuge in him. The end of Psalm 2. 
But he did this so that all who would receive him, all who would believe in his name would be given the right to become children of God. And it's all right here. What a gift. He's given this to you and to me that we might know him. But perhaps you do know God. Maybe you have received his forgiveness, but the law of the Lord is still not a delight for you. What do you do? What do you do? Um, I, you know, Psalm 34 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I think we need to approach, sometimes if, if, if we feel a dryness, can you put up that picture of the tree by the, the, the water? Sometimes we feel like a dry, we don't feel like this, right? We're there, we're in the right place, but there's no life. And it would be really ironic if there was a dead tree that was right there. And we'd say, there's something wrong with that picture. Right? And maybe we need to approach the Word of God differently. Maybe I believe in prayer, and I believe in asking for help in prayer. Asking God to reveal Himself to you, not just in understanding, but to say, God, help me know you. Let this word feed my soul. Let this be a relational experience because I need to hear your voice speaking through these pages. I need to know, I want you to become familiar with your voice in this world. God, can you give me a real hunger for your true voice that I only find right here? I would encourage you to do that. I'd encourage you also, um, because I think it's good... um, to carve out spaces where we have time to process, where we have time to meditate. Where are the places in your life that are like that? I got a hill. I got all these berries. I've got years of meditation ahead of me. It's good for me. It's good for my soul. Where is it for you? You sit in your garden in the dirt, pull out weeds, you have empty spaces in your life where you're not turning over the word of God. You're not letting it get into your mouth, swishing it around, experiencing the fullness of it. I'd encourage you to do that. I think that for us today, the psalmist is encouraging us to drink. You can take a tree to water, but you can't make it drink. And we want to be happy trees, like Bob Ross paints. Trees that have life. Trees that give fruit. I love, uh, and I'll end with this, Isaiah 61. God calls his people a planting of the Lord. Calls them oaks of righteousness. Man, my heart and my desire as we listen to this word this morning is that that's what we become, Seed Church. Oaks of righteousness, planted, drawing life from the word. That's why we're reading the word together. It's not boring. First, First Chronicles is hard, but it's not boring, right? We want to draw life from it together. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for how it speaks and how it's living and alive. And God, I pray that you would put an excitement in from, inside of us, Lord, and that we would glow from being in your presence. Maybe that's a supernatural glow, Father, but maybe it's just a glow of joy and a smile on our face, God, because we're turning over the word of God in our minds and we're not allowing the world to come and influence us with its ad campaign of wickedness. Not becoming desensitized to sex and violence and all kinds of evil, Father, but instead we are drinking from the pure water of your word. And in, it, in us, it is producing fruit that you will use. Use us, Father. That's what we desire. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.